The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams is an American classic. It's also on stage right now here at Ford's Theater. We're going to take a look at this play, which has been around for almost 70 years, and discuss why it's still relevant, how it's the relationship of the American family is still relatable to us today. And we're going to take a closer look at Amanda, the mother of this play. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into her character to see if there is a way that we can uh, develop empathy or understanding for her. Empathy. That's going to be hard for me. I'm not a huge fan of Amanda's. She nags so much. And even if she didn't nag, I don't think that she really sees her kids for who they are. For example, her daughter Laura. Laura has a physical disability and we know that the brace causes her to walk with a limp. Laura is also painfully shy. Yes, but Amanda refuses to acknowledge the difficulties th this disability has caused Laura. Take a look. Little girls who aren't cut out for business careers sometimes end up married to very nice young men. And I'm just going to see that you do that too. But mother, what is it now? I'm crippled. Don't say that word. How many times have I told you never to say that word? You're not crippled. You just got a slight defect. If you'd lived in the day when I was a girl and they had long, graceful skirts sweeping the ground, it might even have been considered an asset. So from this scene, one perspective is that by not allowing Laura to say the word cripple, Amanda doesn't want Laura to feel limited by her disability or limited in any way. She's trying to empower her daughter to see herself as somebody who could have a typical life. Or she's being totally insensitive by not even let her, letting Laura express her feelings about having a disability, about having anxiety and shyness. That's true, but think about this um, from the context of when this play is set. It's set in the 1930s. At that time, I think parents were uh, more authority figures than friends with their children, as many parents are today. I can acknowledge that there are contextual historical difference, and that does make me see Amanda as a parent differently. Mm -hmm. In her mind, Amanda wants what's best for her daughter. She thinks she knows what's best. At this point in the play, Laura's already dropped out of typing school. So Amanda wants Laura to move her life forward, and she knows that she's not going to be able to do that by staying in their house staring at her glass animals all day. I can see that Amanda wants what's best for Laura. But with Tom, surely you can see that she is a terrible nag. She nags and nags him and won't let him write, which is his passion in life. She does nag. I get it. She nags. Um, but I think that it doesn't come from a place of bad intention. I think she really thinks that she's doing what's best for Tom, and it's what she's nagging him about that's important. And in her mind, she's nagging him to be a better person, to be a better man, and to have a better life. I get that she wants him to have a better life, and I understand that. But to not let him write and to nag him and nag him about his posture seems to me like she's taking away all the joy he has in his life. Take a look. Why can't you sit up straight? So your shoulders don't stick through like spells wings. Mother, please go busy yourself with something else. I'm trying to write. Well, I have seen <sighs> a medical chart, and I know what that position does to your internal organs. Sit up, and I'll show you. Oh, mother. What is the matter with you lately, you big, big idiot? No, mother, I haven't got a thing. I haven't got a single thing left in this house that I can call my own. Lower your voice. Yesterday, you confiscated my books. You had the nerve. I did. I took that horrible novel back to the library. What purpose could she have had for taking his books away? That just seems really hard for me to understand. Okay, their financial situation is very difficult. They need Tom's steady income to support this family. He's the main breadwinner for the family. So I think that she sees these books and his dream of becoming a writer as a distraction. It's a distraction from them becoming financially stable. But taking a book away and returning it to the library without his permission 
It seems especially cruel to me. This is his spare time. Is he not to have any joy in his life at all? So it's <laughs> obvious that they have some challenges communicating with each other, but I think this is true in just about every family. That's true. People very rarely say exactly what they mean to in any family. It seems like maybe in this play, uh, Amanda wants to say, I care about you, but it comes out as sit up straighter. Right. It's a pattern of behavior, the nagging, but I think that it is her way of trying to be kind. It just doesn't come across that way. So when she says, put more cream in your coffee, she's trying to say, I care about you. Right. And I have a feeling that this is how she parented when they were six and seven and eight years old, and it came across as maternal and comforting. But as adults, it just feels stifling. It's as though Amanda never adjusted her parenting style to having adult children. Right. Her children have grown up, but she hasn't yet gotten to the place where she understands that they're now adults. And this, this also, I think, is very, very true in many families. That kids just want their parents to see them for who they really are. And parents want their kids to aspire to be more. And that in a family, nobody is perfect. And love is often difficult to communicate, and some people have a really hard time doing it. What do you think about Amanda? Do you feel empathy for her? Can you see where she's coming from? Is she the archetype, which is a typical example of a stifling mother figure? Or is it more complicated than that? Let us know on Twitter, especially after you see the show. At Ford's EDU, hashtag Ford's Glass.